give our lives to you for your service and for your kingdom. Amen. In the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen, church. Amen.
so basically, if this combination of Roe versus Wade and Doe versus Bolton in 1973 basically made it so you can't make any laws about abortion. And seven justices on the Supreme Court decided that. Justices on the Supreme Court are not elected, they're appointed by the government. And so seven people who weren't elected by anybody, nobody voted on this, overturned the laws of all 50 states. All 50 states. And so even, I think, pro-choice people should be against Roe v. Wade for one reason, it's just because it's bad democracy. Seven people decided for the whole country what the abortion law should be. And I think this is largely to blame for why abortion has become such a firebrand topic in our society, why it's so polarized. It's either a yes or no, and there's, 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 there's no political compromise, and I don't think there should be political compromise. But there's, there's lots of places around the world where there are laws that, that allow <coughs> restrictions on abortion, much more so than the United States, like um, England, France, and lots of places through Europe. Even though the populations of those countries are much more pro-choice more pro than America, their abortion laws are much more restrictive. And so Roe versus Wade made it so that the abortion laws in America don't reflect the will of the people at all. So that's one of the reasons we, we um, protest against Roe v. Wade this week is because it's bad democracy, and I think that's something even pro-choice people could recognize. Uh, the second reason we pro-choice, we, uh, excuse me, we protest Roe versus Wade is because it's bad science. One of the things that it said in the Supreme Court decision is it said, well, looking back through history, you know, at the times of the Bible, this is what they believed about when life begins. Thomas Aquinas thought this about when life begins, like the quickening when he could first hear or first feel the baby move. And then you get, there, if you're reading it, it's kind of like, and then, and then, and then, and you expect them to get to the part where in the 19th and the 20th century, they discovered microscopes and they, you know, discovered ultrasounds and they were able to see inside the womb and prove through embryological studies that life begins at conception and they never get there. They just say, well, lots of people have disagreed throughout history and so we don't really know when life begins. Meanwhile, they could have just opened up an embryology textbook and it would have told them that before conception, you have two cells from two different people. You have a sperm from the father's body, which has the father's DNA, and you have an egg from the woman's body, which has the mother's DNA. And both of those are human cells. They have human DNA. And both of them are alive. They are living human cells, but they are not living human beings, right? In the same way, you might have a tumor removed that is living and has your human DNA, but it's not a being. Here's how you know the difference between something that's just living human tissue in a human being. When, how science defines an organism is if you give that living tissue a habitat that it can live in, if you give it nutrients and you give it time, does it grow to become an adult member of the species? Does it grow to become an adult member of the species? And that's what defines just a living tissue from a living organism and an individual living organism. So if you have a sperm and you give it time, habitat, and nutrients, it stays a sperm with its father's DNA. You give an egg from a woman's ovary, time, habitat, and nutrients, it stays an egg. But once fertilization happens, once conception happens, now you have a unique human DNA, and it's a living organism. Give it the right habitat, give it nutrients, give it time, and it becomes like us. Each one of us started off that way. And we knew this at the time of Ruby Wade. We knew this back in the 1900s, even at, you know, in the, at the end of the 1800s. But still, they didn't look at that. So that's the second reason why Roe v. Wade should be overturned. It's bad democracy, but it's also bad science. The third reason that it's bad healthcare, it's bad for women. Because that loophole for the health of the mother is so big, it has allowed abortion clinics, you can use that term loosely, to go unregulated. And other surgical centers that would have regulations and, and, and have state inspections, that's not allowed when it comes to abortion, because every time somebody tries to do that, pro-choice people will say, oh no, that's restricting a woman's access. That's restricting a woman's right. And so, you've probably heard in the news, there's famous examples of women dying from abortions. And there's very little regulation. Um, you know, I, I, at my school where I teach, we need a parent's signature just to give advocate, or just to give um, you know, Tylenol or something like that. 
but yet young women are allowed to receive abortions without parental consent, without any parental notification, and that's not safe. And so, besides just our religious view that every life is sacred, there's a very strong secular argument that we can engage with pro-choice people who may not be religious, and we can say, yes, we, we stand today to overturn Roe v. Wade because it's bad democracy, it's bad healthcare, and it's bad science. And this doesn't mean abortion is the only issue we care about. I mean, I've mentioned lots of issues before, immigration. We talked about people with disabilities. We talked about um, you know, health care. We, talk, we can talk about capital punishment and war. But if you look at the numbers, there are almost 2,000 abortions every day in this country. About 60 million since Roe v. Wade happened. And that dwarfs every other pro-life issue. Not saying those issues aren't important, not saying we shouldn't make this a priority, but there's a reason why we gather today by the thousands and tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands, to say, Yes, that life matters. Yes, every life matters. And that's what we're here for. Amen? Amen? Amen. We're going to start Mass in just a couple minutes. Let's take a moment to just quiet ourselves. Let's pick an intention for the day. I know my intention for the day is just for our, our nation's leaders that they would know in their hearts the value of every human.